So it's no accident then that The Lives of John Lennon by Albert Goldman is at the top or near the top of the bestseller list just three weeks after publication. It's not so much a biography as it is a financial package, nurtured over six long years and pre-sold to the Literary Guild and People magazine. It's already provoked a firestorm of protest. Goldman, who is a former English professor, music critic, and author of biographies on Lenny Bruce and Elvis Presley, has granted only two television interviews about this book. You're about to see one of them. It was done last month prior to publication, a few days after West 57th was allowed to read what America's most controversial biographer had done to the memory of John Lennon. WRIF will now observe 10 minutes of silence in memory of John Lennon. Born October 9th, 1940, died December 8th. 1980. He told about people's souls. He wasn't a regular person. It's such a precious person, and, and he's not here anymore. John was a man who was a very violent person, a person who had fits of violence, a very, very uh, uh, agonized character, not a pretty character, someone who was in pain, someone who was suffering someone who was angry, depressed, that's not a pretty picture, no. And was he generous? No. Was he uh, loving? No. John Lennon wasn't that sort of person, no. That Albert Goldman wrote an unflattering account of John Lennon's life was not unexpected. After all, it was from this typewriter that the world first learned of a 40-year-old, bloated, drug-ravaged, incontinent Elvis Presley clad in diapers. Heaven help you if Goldman does your biography, one author said. An appropriate warning, since his subjects are invariably dead. You are almost hard-pressed to find a single positive anecdote about John Lennon in the it, book. It's a funny thing. I had the same problem with Elvis. People said to me, well, you're just giving us the bad. I said, boy, I would give you, I would give anything to give you the good. It's just damn hard to find it. Nothing good about John Lennon? Well, of course, his talent, sure. But Lennon's talent is not something Goldman chose to write about. In trying to take true measure of the mortal, Goldman has stripped away the very things about Lennon and the Beatles that changed the face of popular culture. The wit, the charm, and of course the music. Well, what is there about the Beatles that you like? They're good! They're they got that certain something. They got that yeah. sound. And here they are, the surprise of the crowd grows, pitch and volume, drowning out the flying of the jet engine. According to Albert Goldman, the John Lennon that came to America in 1964 was a coarse, violent street fighter who may have once actually killed a man. A smoldering hitter, Goldman calls him, who sometimes erupted into a terrifying werewolf. Within a year, Lennon would find fame a disappointing mountain, a view not worth the climb. Not even the drugs and orgies were much fun, according to Goldman. It was a trail that led eventually to despair. John Lennon, man of peace and love, is almost non-existent in Albert Goldman's book, appearing only as the public pose of a charlatan. Instead, Goldman's Lennon, is a demented burnout case so cooked on acid that he believes from time to time he's the messiah. And later, with Yoko Ono, a depraved, depressed heroin addict, a paranoid, anorexic, Howard Hughes-like recluse who ate with his fingers, walked around the apartment nude, being mean to the cat. But eight years ago, Albert Goldman didn't feel that way. Oh, yes. John was a very conscious and self-conscious man who uh, knew exactly what he was doing and yet had very profound intuitions and hunches he followed. Confused? That was Albert Goldman the day after John Lennon was murdered, before he signed the book contract in eulogy. Brilliant man, a genius. This, the skeptics would say, is business. But then I investigated and investigated endlessly, 1,200 interviews, six and a half years research. And bit by bit, every one of these things changed around. You had uh, reportedly a million dollar advance, five and a half years uh, researching this book, 1,200 interviews. 
Well, we didn't get a million dollar advance. You know, that's if you heard that, that's wrong. It was eight fifty. When you say eight fifty, we're talking about not eight hundred and fifty dollars. We're talking about eight hundred. Eight hundred fifty thousand, right? This was not some kind of blood money. You say, well, here's a pile of money. Go out and do a, go out and do a dirty job. That's not what this was. He was going to write the biography of John Lennon. And that's what we got. James Landis is publisher and editor in chief at William Morrow. When the company signed Goldman to do the book, Landis said there was just one fear, that Goldman would write a glowing tribute. He's, the publisher preferred some controversy. It was so tempting. I mean, you have to... Albert Goldman is, is a fantastic commentator on modern culture. And John Lennon is a giant in this culture. And it was an irresistible combination of things. You expected a certain amount of flack. Yes, sure. Uh, you must love it. I like it. It's all right. It sells books. Well, it gets people talking about, certainly gets them talking about books or this book in particular. If, there had been, if silence greeted the publication of this book, it would be vastly disappointing in many ways, uh, especially at the, at the cash register, right? Well, we've had certain books that have been greeted with silence and they've sold quite well, but uh, um, it, would have been, it would have been disappointing. That much time, that much effort, that much money on the line, there are expectations that you're going to find something that other people just didn't know. I think that's a safe expectation with me because I'm one of the best investigative reporters, I think, in the world today. I mean, I always discover something new, whether it's the death of Bruce Lee or drugs in South America or I come back with the story that's my reputation that's what I'm proud of that's what I'm motivated by. What did you come back with this time? Well, what I are think the we things that are going to be in the newspaper that we're going to see in the newspaper? Well first of all there's the marriage of John and Yoko which is going to look a lot different than people saw it traditionally she was the one they were trying to make the star not he. How is your John Lennon different from the other John Lennons that have been written about in these books? I mean my book is a lot bigger in every dimension. In other words, I have the full length of his life. I have the full breadth, all the background, all the other people. What about Paul McCartney? Did you talk to Paul McCartney? Well, Paul said, well, I loved Albert's book on Lenny Bruce, but I didn't like what he did to Elvis, and I don't want to cooperate. So that was it. And you didn't talk to Harrison or Ringo Starr? No. Harrison's like a hermit. And Ringo's under contract to do his book. And Yoko Ono. Yoko Ono under contract, likewise. It, it must be very difficult to do the definitive John Lennon book without talking to Paul McCartney, George Harrison, Ringo Starr, Yoko Ono. You have to remember that sources are only as good as they are willing to be forthcoming and frank. A lot of the stuff that's in the book were pretty well known. I mean, certainly Yoko, an awful lot has been written about Yoko's influence over John. Uh, there have been things written about his drug habit. Those are all incidents that have been mentioned in other books. Perhaps, I don't know. I mean, what's your question? question is, what's really new about this book? Well, you've asked me this question about six times, now I've answered it six times, so that's the last time I'm answering it, okay? Well, what I'm looking for is, what does this book bring to the table that wasn't on the table before, I suppose? It's the kind of question that really doesn't have a succinct answer, okay? I mean, there's 71 chapters. There's new information in each chapter you want. To go down the 71 chapters, you don't. Whom he confessed years later, he had, quote, loved more than a woman. For a woman to stir John deeply, she clearly had to possess a strong masculine component. Here is where the aggressive Yoko began to tip the beam, which she inclined further by being an Oriental, Lenin's favorite type, and further yet by embodying the New York avant-garde scene, which meant a lot now to John since he had become the leader of the rock avant-garde. In fine, John Lennon was a man upon whom Yoko could work her spell. Albert Goldman's 700-page biography of John Lennon came out last year. Now it's coming out in paperback. Its initial reception was that of shock and anger. Hardly surprising when, among other things, this unauthorized work announces that Lennon had a long homosexual relationship with Brian Epstein. Understandable, too, when none of the key people close to Lennon agreed to give interviews for this book. After his controversial biography of Elvis Presley, no one expected the book to be entirely complimentary about its subject. Goldman, a former academic, claims 1,200 interviews were conducted over the six-year period it took him to write the book. 
but he has jettisoned his experience as a music critic to concentrate on the personal aspects of Lennon's life. He emphasizes sex, drugs, and rock and roll in that order. In many ways, this is an expansive book. It's large in size and large in claims. It sifts through every stage of Lennon's life, from childhood, early days with the Beatles, to celebrity, and finally to his death in 1980. Its accounts are detailed, quoting conversations and thoughts. It gives us the feeling we have inner access to Lennon's world. But Goldman's book raises a number of thorny questions about the nature of biography. Can we accept as truthful a work that relies so heavily on secondary sources? Is secondhand enough? How biased can a biographer be before his work degenerates into a personal statement? Goldman, for instance, seems to feel the wrong Lenin was shot. And what is the real job of a biographer? To dutifully log someone's life? Or to create a color piece that will also be a compelling read? With Albert Goldman in the studio is Hunter Davis. Davis is the only person ever to have had full access to the Beatles, and he wrote the authorized Beatles biography in 1968. Even Goldman credits the book in his sources as indispensable for any writer on the subject. Albert Goldman, you weren't able to use primary sources, and many of your secondary sources weren't exactly best friends of the Lennons. You had to decide who to trust. Explain to me why we should trust you in the decisions you took. Well, I dispute the notion of a secondary and primary source as you define it. <clears throat> as, a, define as a biographer it? defines it, a primary source is someone who had a direct experience of John Lennon. Paul McCartney had no direct experience of John Lennon for years and years at the end of John Lennon's life. I spoke with people who worked with John Lennon, spoke to him every day of his life, were visitors in his house every day of his life. Those are the primary sources. Paul McCartney would be no source at all for those final five, six, seven years of John's life, which are highly controversial because they were highly concealed. So I think your presentation here to the television audience is extremely misleading and inaccurate. Well, I want to ask you one other thing. From these sources, you have built up a huge mountain of details. Do you feel you've been able to put it in a real context, that you've been able to pull back and see an overview of why Lennon's life is seen as a metaphor for his age by so many people? That was not my assignment, uh, nor was my assignment to analyze his music. The most famous biography of a musician in mm -hmm. the English language is Thayer's biography of Beethoven. At the beginning, he begins by saying that he will not discuss Beethoven's music because it's so well known to the public. And that's not his primary responsibility as a biographer. If his music is well known to the public, think what the Beatles' music is to the public. We had one volume in which we could put all the information we collected. In the original draft, I did discuss at greater length John Lennon's music because I am a music critic. But in the final draft, we had to concentrate on the life or we would have sacrificed a great deal that was new. So that was the reason for that decision. And when you use the word assignment, who, you, who sets the assignment? What's the nature of the assignment? The assignment is created by the actual work. In other words, there are conditions to our work. In the old days, uh, you could have uh, six volumes for a biography. That's Lockhart's mm -hmm. Life of Scott. Uh, three volumes would not have been unusual, let's say, to write Dickens' life if you were Forster, his friend. In the modern world, one thick book is it, and it's quite a struggle to get that done, too. So we had a limited amount of space in which to deal with a vast amount of research material. But to characterize the material as inferior, as secondhand, or anything like that, I dispute that entirely. I think that's an utterly false well, characterization. Well, we're talking about the, the material that didn't come from Yoko, Paul, George, Ringo. And that, I think, is a terribly naive conception of biography and of research. All of those people, let's take Cynthia, for example. She wrote her own book mm -hmm. to start with, OK? Then uh, Cynthia cooperated with Peter Brown, then she made a contract uh, with another biographer and uh, wrote a great book about uh, uh, John Lennon in two volumes. <clears throat> That's Ray Coleman. So now we have had three lengthy accounts by this lady of her relationship with her ex-husband. What do you think if she had given me grudgingly a little interview to get me off her back? She would have given me that would have so enormously expanded what we already have. What do you think, supposing Paul had accommodated me with a half hour of his busy life, would have been so forthcoming there that it would have revolutionized the view of Lenin. Well, that's now, that's that that's isn't how Hunter. it's done. Hunter, you, you did have access. You handled the first half of this story. 
and you did speak to these people. How do you feel about the way Albert's handled the second half of the story? Well, uh, you've got to remember that everybody's entitled to write a biography. You don't have to pass any exam. And it's also true that once people are dead, that's a good time to do it. And it's free time to do it. People can't sue. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with doing a dead person. And also, things should be done regularly because you see things more clearly after an event is over. And I was doing it 20 years ago. It was in the middle of it. Yes, I was really reporting what they were saying yes. and getting their memories and getting experiences as they were happening. I didn't know the end, so I feel envious of Mr. Goldman, Professor Goldman, that he could stand back and see all the material. All this, let's not argue with the use of the word primary and secondary, all this amazing amount of material. Well, since you brought up that, it yeah. does have very much the style of a novel. You're, you're making us privy to how people felt when they did something mm -hmm. or the actions they took. She reached up and picked up this. Now, what made you take on that sort of style? What determined the style? <clears throat> well, this is not the first biography I've written. Yes. And uh, all my life, I've been a student of biography. <clears throat> it seems to me <clears throat> all biography aspires to be eyewitness biography. So I speak to eyewitnesses. I speak to them over and over again. Uh, if you think I interview them once or twice or even five or six times, you're mistaken. Sometimes I interview, inter interview a key source 30, 40, 50 times. But is times. it you that does those interviews? It's your researchers who do many of them. If it's an they? important source, you can believe I do it. But ah. so many of these people were miles and miles away from the actual event. I mean, you have in the early in the book, you have people who are babysitters who observed John Lennon's nappies. That was the sort of level of it. And you draw conclusions from these people. The bit I laughed aloud at was this woman you'd interviewed, or one of your research interviews, who was a neighbor. Uh, all the woman is called to evidence is the fact that the next door neighbor, who is surely some sort of a, witness to a, the people who lived, who lived to, next door to her, well, there's only there's one neighbor in a, in a house that's a double house with a common wall. There's only one such neighbor. And she does have a relationship with these people because you can't help but have such a relationship if you're living in the same building as they were. And what she said was that um, these were people who were looked at askance, that they were unfriendly and so forth. That has nothing at all to do directly with John Lennon. But it does help to establish what is also established from other sources, that he grew up as a working class lad passing, as we would say in America, for a middle class. And you can't do that. You can't get away with that. If you are black and you're trying to pass as white, if you're a working class and I'm you're lost, trying to I'm pass I'm as middle lost. class in Wait, England... Let's just, get to, let's just get back to basics That's the issue. here. What seems to be coming out of this is that it's very difficult when a figure is as big as John Lennon or indeed mm. Elvis Presley to actually establish any objective truth. Is that what another instance no, is something that caused that, you to I don't use find a that an issue at all. Style? Why did you carry on when nobody would see you? I'm sorry, I didn't understand your question. You couldn't see Paul, you couldn't see George, you couldn't see Ringo. But you had seen them all, and you'd yeah. reported everything they'd said. Now, suppose I went and talked to but them. my books exist. <clears throat> what do you do? A, a well, all them? biography, I, it seems to me that's a terribly naive statement. All biography that, yeah. builds upon previous biography. It's a cumulative thing. It's like a science. No biographer starts off as if he didn't know the other biographers had already done whatever they did. So if you think because you spoke to them, you exhausted the subject, I disagree completely. Did you ever get depressed then that nobody would see you? Did you ever think, oh, I wish I could find these people and get some new material? If it had been possible to go to Yoko Ono, for example, and say, I want the real story of your yeah. marriage, not the myth, not all the stuff you've put out in order to make yourself look like uh, a contemporary couple or a, a wonderfully happy couple or, or whatever your purpose was in these uh, uh, illusions you created. And she had said, I have always wanted to tell this to someone, and you are the one I will tell it to. Yes, that could have been quite an exciting experience, but it would have been a totally unrealistic expectation. I never had that expectation from day one. Hunter, let me ask you some version of what Goldman is indeed implying. You did speak to the primary sources, but don't you feel in a way that compromised your books, just as not speaking to primary sources might compromise a book? I was compromised. Hey, excuse me, may, may I add also, you not only were compromised, mm -hmm. Since you've been so critical of me, you oblige me to be critical of you. You not only were compromised in the sense that you were the official biographer, that is to say you could not publish a word these people had not passed upon. And this meant Aunt Mimi, for example, who wasn't even one of the well, Beatles, let, let him answer the could, question go, excuse me, could go through his book and just root out anything of his that she didn't think was seeming, was appropriate, made her look good or made John look good. 
he was also paid, am I not mistaken, under an arrangement that had been guided by this organization. No, totally wrong. First of all, Mimi did not... Let's get the general thing. John said, and I'm quoting yeah, John Lennon... It was bullshit. ...that yeah. she took out a lot of home truths. But you know John got things wrong. I wrote to John, I have a letter from John apologizing for what he said. What <laughs> happened was that when John, as it were, came out of the closet 10, 15 years after my book and started saying outrageous things about his own life, a lot of which was exaggerated, like the little homosexual thing is totally false, and you made a whole thesis of it with no... How would you know it was totally false? Ah, what makes you such an authority let, let on that? Let me finish my thing, your accusation. What Mimi did, and I have at home, she wrote me a letter saying, this is not true in the margin, uh, this never happened, John never swore when he was a little boy. <laughs> no, what are you laughing at? Well, you how heard, little, like three years old? You haven't heard the end of it. Yes. Right, so I went to see Mimi, and John said, keep her quiet. So I went through, and I argued the toss, and I thought, this is what John remembers, and I put in, to keep Mimi quiet, a little phrase at the end of a chapter on John's childhood, in which Mimi says, and John was as happy as the day was long. I took nothing out, and I've got all the facts about it. John thought I did, but I didn't. I took nothing out to keep Mimi happy. I put something mm -hmm. in, which was rubbish. The rubbish statement was, John, but, but that was true. I think you're missing the point. I think you're missing the point. The point is you simply... You made this allegation, and I the, took everything I think out. you're missing the point. The point is that in John Lennon's eyes, you didn't tell the story of his childhood, and I don't think you did. Oh, well, who can do that? You I think, I, think I came a lot closer. No. I restored, I restored I the missing man, proving, his father. No. I think we're proving I that biography... The father. You never met the father. I think huh. we're proving that biography is an inexact science here. Do you think these biographies, Albert Goldman, that you've authored, are changing the rules of biography. Just a last word quickly. Well, I don't know about the rules, but let's say they've been widely imitated. And Hunter, It's pure you? faction. It's all, it's, it's potty theories built on very slim, massive, trivial evidence, and he makes these sweeping generalizations for which he's got very little proof whatsoever. Thank you very much, Albert Goldman, Hunter Davis. That's all for this week. The Late Show will be back on Monday night at 11.15. <laughs> Tonight, genius or monster, the legend of John Lennon is up front. And the hard sell of soft porn. What is Madonna doing for women? Please welcome your presenters, Lucy Meacock and Anthony Wilson. What beautiful thing. <laughs> oh, good evening. Uh, you may have noticed we've moved from our regular Friday slot for this penultimate week of our run. Elbowed out, no harm, by Coronation Street tomorrow night, their big celebrations. But we're here a night early to discuss a murderous bully and closet homosexual. Just two possible descriptions of John Lennon contained in the book by American author, you heard his name mentioned there, the legendary himself, Albert Goldman. Yes, tonight, ten years after his murder, we debate the lives of John Lennon and ask Mr. Goldman whether he's not guilty of assassination himself. John Lennon. What did I think? I enjoyed the book enormously. John Lennon. Um, yes, I did enjoy the book. The Lives of John Lennon by Albert Goldman was the most uh, explosive uh, rockumentary of the 80s. It made an effort, perhaps, to tell the Lennon story. It may have destroyed some memories. In the next 20 minutes, we ask... What are we remembering? Alan Williams, the first Beatles manager. Do you think the Goldman biography and the fuss about it in the last two couple of years has got in the way of the hero worship? Uh, What's no, the reality, Alan? No, not at all. Uh, in actual fact, if he had been more honest in his book about John Lennon, it would have been a bestseller. As I'm told now, it's a flopperoo. Those bullets, those five bullets that were pumped into John Lennon, he thought they were worth their weight in gold to him and everybody else has written about John's Lennon death. Why, if it was such a good subject, did the man not write it when he was alive? We all know that dead well, men we'll, cannot we'll sue. Him. We'll ask him, we'll ask Mr. Goldman that who's in the studio in New York, ready to talk to us in a moment. Brian O'Hara from a contemporary group of Foremost, a Liverpool beat group at the time. You, had to ha you were around with Lennon, you were working. He wasn't the perfect character, the peace and love character, we think. Now, let's be honest, Goldman, Goldman's book, he wasn't the wonderful guy, was he? He was a very talented, lovable scallywag from Liverpool. Hey, hey. And uh, Lennon was a hurricane, Goldman was a fart, and that's the comparison. All right, all right, Mr. O'Hara, yeah. we'll put that a second. Joe Flannery, Joe Flannery, on my side, on my right-hand side here, 
The organiser of the John Lennon Statue Appeal in Liverpool. Yeah. A big fan. Very big. Do you think the Lennon, the Lennon memory has been solid? Absolutely. Absolutely solid. Solid? Um, yes, I would say so. I'm saying so. solid, dirty. Yeah. You're saying it's solid, it's not, no problem. No, no Lennon's problem still a wonderful, me. nice guy. No problem, no problem to me. No, it's no problem to me. And like Alan said, if why does this man write books about dead people? I would like to throw a challenge to this man tonight. Why doesn't he write a book about, let's say, Michael Jackson while he's still alive? I'll ask him, we'll ask him. Ask we'll him. ask him, we'll ask him. Yeah. Mr. Goldman, do I take it you're there in our New York studio? You may take it. Well, we do then. Good evening, Albert. May I ask you Good why? Evening. Why? I mean, your you. book about Elvis was famous. I think he was dead as well. Why do you write about dead people is the question our audience wants to know. Well, a biographer is primarily concerned to tell a man's story, and uh, you can't tell a story until you know it. Uh, I would say probably about 99 and 44 one hundredths percent of all biographies are about people that's dead. I, th I think it's kind of a stupid question. But if the point of the question is to indicate that I'm afraid to write about the living, just bear in mind that about 99 percent of the people in my books, such as Yoko Ono, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, on and on and on, are all very much alive. They are all very well healed. They are certainly capable of suing me for millions of dollars. So I don't see that uh, I'm protected from any risk at all when I write these books. All right. C can we get it clear for those people? Some people didn't read your book. I think they missed out. You make out, uh, there's a feeling that a very rather weak, really quite unpleasant man, this John Lennon. Am I right? Is that what you felt after the several years of research, Mr. Goldman? I felt that he was a, a very damaged person, and uh, consequently, uh, the strength of him canceled out, was canceled out by uh, all the, the suffering and neurosis in him, and eventually he just broke down and became uh, a drug addict and uh, a sort of a captive, <laughs> and uh, ultimately a person who was continually thinking about getting out of this world into the next world. He seemed to be half in love with death by the end of his life. Was he, even in his early creative period, was he a bully? That seems to, that seems to come over from the book as well. Oh, yes, I think so. But that, that's nothing very remarkable, is it? I mean... <laughs> you don't like pop angry... stars, do you? You write about pop stars, Albert. You don't, li you don't yes. like most of them, do you, really? Well, I never knew what they were. In my early years, I just wrote about uh, their performance, their art, their, their uh, gift for entertainment. I really didn't know anything about them. Once I began investigating them, yes, I, I think on the whole, they're consistently a pretty ugly lot. Uh, Mr. Goldman, uh, don't you uh, go along with that? Most great artists, talented artists, geniuses do have uh, tormented minds, and that's why their genius comes out sometimes. Well, most times. All right, Alan, I would like to write that, your that, that, autobiography. You to, excuse me. Yes, yes. please, Albert. I think Wait, you have to make a you. distinction, though. An artist is someone who we can just concentrate on his art and let the man go. You know, Nietzsche said that, that artists shouldn't be taken seriously. They're just the manure out of which their art grows. But a John Lennon is not simply an artist. He was a great culture hero, generation hero, a symbol of the international peace movement and so forth. He's someone that people have taken to their hearts, who they feel they know. People have built their lives on the imitation Can of I ask you, people have modeled their marriages Albert, I must on ask what you they take must, to be I, his. I want to move along with this. Do you think they took them, him to their hearts wrongly? I don't think they had the faintest idea who he really was. They Thank were just infatuated <clears throat> with an image that they largely created out of their own fancies, yes. All right, I got a man here, Dave Vaughan. He was an op artist back in the old days. You actually painted Lennon's car, didn't you, Dave? Is that right? Yeah, I was the architect behind that, yeah. You painted the old Rolls Royce. Yeah. You don't like hero worship. Don't you think Albert Goldman has done a great work for us here by debunking this myth we've all fallen in love with? No, he's, he's not done that. He's, uh, he's slandered the memory of John Lennon to some tune, this man. Dollars, he, it's called. Well, what does that mean, slandered his memory? I mean, I don't even understand what that means. Well, you should do. You're a good writer. No, no, come on, Dave. He's so saying, you say. Uh, Mr. Goldman, you, you say you told the truth. Is that, is that what you're saying here? How can that be Mr. Slander? Go Mr. Goldman, all uh, these, pawn, no all these pawns in your game that you have got to write this about John Lennon, yeah? 
Didn't any one of them say good thing about him? Yes, All some of them said good things, but I mean, so what? Uh, did anybody yeah, say good? Uh, did any one person say a good thing about John Lennon? Yes, yeah, certainly. So what? Well, why haven't you shown it in this book then? Because sure this book said... is 846 pages of pure venom. Yeah. Uh, right. I, no, wait, 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 wait. I want to ask. No, no, Alan, you've had your turn a second. Yeah, okay. I got no, a couple. I, I got a couple of non. Couple of not. Because we couldn't, we're cheapskates, Joe. <laughs> it's Christmas in New York, Joe. Christmas in New York is more fun than Christmas in Liverpool. I'll come back to you in a minute. I've got two journalists here, Stephen Wells and Tony Jasper. Now, here we go. Stephen Wells, you are known, you're a ranking journalist, aren't you? Really? Music <laughs> I like to think so. I like to think that. Right? Yeah, sure. You have gone on record as saying that Lennon is an obnoxious git. I think that's true, yeah. You think that's true? Now, so... How would you know? You're too young. How would you know that Lennon's an obnoxious well, you're there. kid? No, I, I, I never met Hitler either, but I've got exactly. an opinion on him as well. No, um, I think that he was an obnoxious kid, and that's why he was the best Beatle. I mean, basically, you had the drummer, who nobody really cares about. You had, you had the nice hippie. You, you, had, the, you had the big girl's brows, and you had John Lennon, who was the obnoxious kid. And that's why he's my favourite Beatle. Were you Beatle there? And your favourite Beatle. Hey, we didn't see you in the back <coughs> of the van when we were going to gigs. <laughs> Where were you? All right. I was probably still in his scrotal sack at so the time. So, an obnoxious kid is okay. So, are you, are, are you with Mr. Goldman then? This is a valuable No, I, I, th I, think Mr. I think Mr. Goldman's problem is he doesn't really like pop music at all. He doesn't really understand it. He's the man who rubbished, uh, rubbished uh, Mountain Deep River High. Is that, is that right? Do you, well, I have to ask this question, Mr. Goldman. <laughs> I do respect you. Did you rubbish Mountain Deep River? Mountain High, River Deep. Mountain High, River, River Deep. Come on. <laughs> He's laughing, he's laughing, Stephen. He's laughing. Well, anyway, yeah, well, never, never, anyway. Never titles. But basically, I think, I think he's a vulture, right? But if, if the, if the Leninets didn't keep digging the corpse up, he would have nothing to feed on in the first place. You all bought the book. He's no corpse. Oh, no corpse. Uh, Brian O'Hara, Brian, please. There isn't any corpse about. Switch your no. radio on every 11 seconds, day and night, throughout the world. Is a beetle or Lennon? Well, tell us about it's it, I know. Still, it's still know. there. There's nothing to look back at. It's in baby boomer. It's still there. I know that. And all that guy does is get a pen and a Ouija board and write about dead people and that's it. He that's should only research. Well, he should have been in Leningrad with me three weeks ago. 10,000 people a tribute to John Lennon. Yeah. What about that yeah. fart, golden oh, fart? Oh, yeah. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Tony, can I make the point? I want to make, no, no. I want to put Stephen Wells' point to Robert Goldman. That it is precisely because he was so outrageous, in some cases unpleasant, in some cases peculiar, that made him the most attractive star of the 60s. Mr. Goldman. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it was the hostile or tough side of him that cut through a lot of the crap of, uh, of pop music and appealed to us, precisely. All right. Well, we have that some... That was the good oh, side of him. Some good. Yeah. Hold on, Albert. Hold on a second. You matter here. Yes, sir. Yeah. Can I just ask Mr. Goldman what was his actual purpose for writing the book in the first place? Was it money? Yes. Yes. Albert, yes. Albert, can you hear that? What was the purpose, the deep purpose? Well, I don't, that's a kind of simplistic question, the purpose. I don't You're think a biographer ever has a purpose. You're just a second-rate writer who just needed the money. What's wrong with that? Basically, when you write a biography... Uh, Quiet. Let Mr. Goldman reply, please. Go on, Albert. You're... you're your panelists, or whatever you call these people, they, they seem very intent on interviewing themselves. I don't know why they need me. And you're patronizing. If I wasn't mind. shutting them up and coming back to the New York feed, Albert, they probably would be talking to themselves, don't worry. Tony Jasper, can I, you, your opinion now of the whole, the, the Lennon business, don't you think, whose side are you on? As you watch Mr. Goldman there and you watch the Lennon fans, where do you stand on this? I kind of think maybe the Lennon fans here would have invented something like Lennon, even if he didn't exist. I mean, to me, Lennon was a great rock and roll singer. But why do people want to say other things about him? And I want to know, too, why, for instance, some of the audience would say to some words I read which Lennon said in 1971, he said, if I had my life again, I would like to have been born in New York. I would like to have been an American. Why did he say that? What's that got to do with gold? It's got to do with the fact, right, that Liverpoolians don't half love Lennon, and Lennon did very little for Liverpool. That's right. He put our name on the map all over the world. Have you got us here tonight? Yeah. What? No, good question. Mr. McGann. I'm going to come to Mr. Mr. McGann played Lennon at the Empire, a brilliant performance. I saw it myself. Mark McGann, what have you got to say to the battle? You've listened to all this stuff. Go on. I think with, for fear of, of upsetting a few of my partisan friends in here, 
I think I'd like to say that I've, I've, I haven't read the whole book. I've read snatches of the book. And what it appears to me that Mr. Goldman is obviously a very accomplished writer. I think you undermine your skill somewhat by opting for a, a sensationalist, journalistic style, especially in the manipulating way. I mean, when you call Yoko, for instance, a, a skilled general, that's very pointed, it's very manipulative. I think you can be as factual. I enjoyed the book. I think, it was fact I think there was plenty in there which was informative, and for that reason I enjoyed reading it, for fear of upsetting a few people here. But I think your choice, your, your, the manipulation of the book is what is under scrutiny and question here tonight. And I think that's unfair. Would you say you manipulated it all? Made it sound very uh, groovy? When you, write a, when you write lives that are like the lives in soap operas, it very often just comes out that way. Exactly. It's sensationalist. It's like a soap opera. I think, I think it's why, a shame. <clears throat> but that's the quality of he their lives. He gave you enjoyment, Mark. You just said you enjoyed reading it. Yes, uh, exactly. No, but I think... It, it's well, I think we should ask ourselves, in the same way that the people in, in here will blindly be, at times, Lenin fans, I think we, you can't elevate the status of people and expect to draw the line anywhere. I think that's where you have a right to write the book. But I think you should be under scrutiny, because if you have an opinion, then people should be able to criticise that opinion. And I think that's where we should keep this debate tonight. I think it's, it's getting a bit out of hand, really. Mr. Goldman? You know, when you write a book like this, you don't have any simple purpose. You spend years and years, you talk to thousands of people, and what emerges is a sort of product of evolution. The idea that you sit down with a design to do this, to do that, you don't have the faintest idea when you begin one of these books where you're going to end up. I started out with one opinion of Lenin when I was through. I, I couldn't imagine how I ever had that opinion. It, it's a product of a long, he never spoke complicated, to thousands of people. and... Uh, you never spoke to thousands sort of, of people, Mr. Albert, Goldman. I've got someone here saying that there was thousands of people you didn't speak to. He didn't speak to the people who oh, really you, didn't Mr. Goldman, Goldman. Oh, let know. him reply. Oh, Mr. Goldman, can I ask him? Yes, well, know, I, I, Albert, I wait a second for a question say, from the audience. You say you, asked, you spoke to thousands of people. You credit thousands of people in the book, mm. but half of the book is a rip-off from lots of other books. Yeah. Yeah. From yeah. way back, so every, and every a, lot of, a lot of beat yeah, people I think today never spoke point, to you. To and get a word in uh, I don't think you really understand very much about biography. All biography is cumulative. I met three researchers of yours who well, don't like offer me, me like money. I answer you, or do you just want to blab on? If you want to blab on, I'll just blab on too, and then we'll both be talking well, across purposes. Well, you come purposes. to Liverpool and blab like? on. Because I can just talk right through you, too. All right. Albert, can I put you, put you a serious question? Uh, certainly one of your major researchers did disown the book, did he not? Yes. He what? He disowned the book, did he not? Or is that... I don't know who you're talking about or who this person is. Ron Ellis. No? Names? You want names, the Mr. Name Goldman? Ron Ellis. Okay, fine, Mr. Goldman. I never, heard, I never heard Ron Ellis say You don't know about anybody. All right. Can I put another thing to you? I have a friend of mine who was interviewed, and at the end of the interview by your researcher... They felt as if they'd been raped. I know that's a strange word well, to I don't use. Know who, I don't know who the researcher was. Who was this researcher? Oh. One of your thousands of people. How much money did you earn? I don't have oh, thousands Let me ask you, I, had one I have to ask you another question then. I said, there is a feeling that if the book had been more positive about Lenin, you'd have sold more copies. Do you share that feeling, Mr. Goldman? Oh, absolutely. In fact, if the book had been a big rave-up of Lenin, it would have made far more money. Yes, absolutely. That's why the whole argument that I do it for money is preposterous. Uh, Come to Liverpool, right. Mr. No, no, Norman. one at a time. Yeah. I'd like to ask Mr. Reeve here, who's a, a local commentator. <laughs> James, you've listened to this argy-bargy between the Lenonites and Mr. Goldman. How, how are you seeing this going? It's all, uh, it's all rather sad, this, because um, John Lennon was... I mean, I've heard the word genius used behind me here, yes. which um, he wasn't. He was a very talented man. He was a very talented man who was elevated to a status beyond that which he had, which was admittedly considerable, but nowhere near how he finished up. He was given that status by the media at the time and the social climate at the time, and a lot of people have carried that image around with them for 25 years. So they were conned the first time round, and now, and I don't blame him for it because it's getting near Christmas, Mr Goldman is conning them again by getting them at it and charging them 16 quid or whatever the book is for the uh, Actually, they're charging 4 99 James. Just for the back there. <laughs> sir, it's sir. Hold on, quiet, please, one at a time. The gentleman at the back with the white T-shirt. Yes, you, sir. 
Um, aren't we guilty all the way through this? Although he was a very charismatic guy, he was very talented. You could call him a genius, yes. Um, but aren't we guilty all the time? I just want to put this note in that aren't we making him um, a demigod? Aren't we putting him on too high a pedestal? If he were here now, wouldn't he be disgraced to hear us like arguing over him, well, making yeah, him this great idol? Let him, well, let me ask Mr. Goldman. Let me ask you, Mr. Goldman. Was, did, would Lenin have decried this, or did Lenin want to be a mythical creature, from your, your belief, sir? Well, I certainly think all pop stars want to be mythical creatures. That's the name of the game. And, uh, of course, Lenin would love to think that we were sitting here talking about him. Um, he did everything in his power to make himself as immortal as he could. The idea that he would rub out his fame or make light of it, nonsense. All right, Stephen Wells, is this the usual thing for pop stars? They, would, they do like to be in this position, do they not, sir? What position is this? Have everybody talking about them. Oh, be in the diary the pages. Diamond. Everyone's going berserk yeah, well, about them. The thing is, when you talk about Lenin, right, I mean, for me, Lenin represents many, many sort of great, wonderful things that came out of the 60s. Sexual liberation, he, he got into feminism, he got, he, got, he got into politics in a big way. He moved all the way from revolution, which was an insipid cop-out, to power to the people and working class hero, which were great songs right now. I don't, like, I, don't, I don't like Goldman's books. I, I think, in a way, it's an attack on those ideas and those ideals. But more than that, he was a human being, and he was a very flawed human being. And that's the purpose the book does serve. That, you know, to, to put Lenin up there as this, this I don't like that word, like genius, right? Yeah? It's to elevate him above, uh, to make him more important than he actually, has, he actually was at the time. You look at what was good on, say, 1968, right? 20 million people in, on strike in France. Riots on, on the streets of Paris from the students and the, and the riot police. A revolution in Czechoslovakia, the Tet Offensive in Vietnam. Where was Lenin? In you know, where bed. Was he? He, he was, was dead in... when he wrote it. He was in bed. You know, he so, was so dead. you know, I defend his uh, ideas. Don't defend the man. Don't defend you, the you're boss. okay. You're right, okay. Dave Vaughan, Dave Vaughan, Dave Vaughan, please. Dave Vaughan and Joe, Joe, no, Dave Vaughan's no. turn. He wrote while he was dead. Dave Vaughan's turn on the front row, sir. Mr. Goldman. You made a description in this book about a man being shot, a man being murdered. It was a graphic description about his blood going into his lungs and everything like that. We can't even feel the pain, can we? We've not been shot yet, have we? Yeah? I don't know and what you, that feels Just a minute, like, mate. You I came over like a vampire when you wrote that. A brilliant description. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Well, I'm sorry. And it was now, a description Chapman did offer. that. Chapman did that. But you have murdered him again. Yeah, yeah. Just a minute. But Dave, I'm you, sorry, you Dave. Have Dave, 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 Dave. In the metaphysical sense, again. Yes, I have And that's what you tried indeed. to do, murder his memory. You might and even that, say, mate, let you are Dave, Dave, let, bastard. Let, bastard. Dave, let him reply, and, and there's no need for that at this point of the time. Please, Mr. Goldman, go ahead, sir. Uh, you know, I feel like I'm conducting this debate in a bar room or someplace like that. <laughs> yeah. That's, the, the the that's part can... of the ethos of the show, sir. We would like to have you here the in The guy who can Come yell the, the loudest uh, prevails every time. Let him finish, please. I don't think describing John Lennon's death accurately and vividly is murdering him. No, I think that's just hysterical nonsense. No, I think he's describing what you did to his memory by unearthing all these facts, which may or may not have been true. Is that what you mean by metaphysical? His memory, no, excuse no, me, I think his memory is in very good shape. description in this book. All right. Okay, thank you very much. You, sir, in the middle there. Yes, you, sir. His memory. Is there really? No, hold on a second. Albert, it's just one of our problems here is there's a two-second delay listening to you <laughs> over the satellite. It makes it complicated. You, sir, I yes. I see. I'd just like to make one point. I don't really think we're going to worry too much. In two or three years' time, his book is going to be in second-hand shops gathering dust. And John Lennon's it's music will be book. even stronger. Right, the you, this is what I'd like, no, like to hear. Hold on, you just said it's a brilliant this book. This is all rubbish. That book is excellent. Um, I enjoyed it. I, I don't know what they're all talking about. I, uh, I went to the book uh, thinking uh, Lennon was, was a demigod. Yes. I came away thinking he just, he's a great guy, but he's flawed and he'd been manipulated. Fine. Good uh, job, It can Brian. be found, it Brian, can be Brian. found, yes. Oh. Can we put it all in perspective? <laughs> I was in touch with your, Mr. Goldman, I was in touch with your publishers today and also with EMI Records. Your book is now on what they call the remainder shelf already, which Naturally, means that they sell it very, very cheap. It sold 70,000 full stop in England. That's the figure. Well, so I what? was around when what? Lennon's what? records were selling 1.2 million per day. Exactly. <clears throat> and at the end of the day, your book <clears throat> is absolutely nothing. Lennon's music will go on forever. And that's, that's it, perspectively. <laughs>
Uh, uh, Tony, right. you've got yourself... Right. Hold on, yeah. Alan, a very Good quick point from Alan Williams, anyway, please, sir. I went to the library to get it today. I went into the section under autobiographies. It wasn't there. It was in the, it was in the fiction right. section. Right, Let, madam here, this lady in the front row, please. Madam. I'll be quite glad. I'll be quite glad when the Beatles aren't all that there is about Liverpool and some more young people can come through with something different. Yay. I'd like to ask Mr. Goldman, actually, as someone who's looked at all this, what do you think the Beatles, and Lennon in particular, did for Liverpool? I don't think they did a thing for Liverpool. Why are you asking him? He doesn't know anything about the Beatles. He's not from Liverpool, and perhaps he has an opinion. Mr. Jasper, what do, what do you think about the Liverpool love affair? Be quiet, please, why don't you? have all had a chance. Mr. Jasper, what about the Liverpool love affair with the Beatles? Well, I think taking up the point which they were saying in the front row is interesting in the recent Liverpool televised event that when I've talked to the younger pop stars and talked to people like the Christians and others, they were horrified by the whole event. You know, they thought Lennon would be singing with them, not with the old codgers who came along to sing a few songs and bringing out Kylie Minogue just for the sake of getting an audience. And I believe, I mean, perhaps Liverpool people could tell me, isn't there a big debt still owing from that, that concert? Was, that was a Yoko Ono promotion, nothing to do with Lennon's music. Wasn't that was Yoko Ono. Liverpool, oh. Liverpool City Council supported it. Liverpool wanted to tell the world it was their concert. Liverpool want people to come to Liverpool. It was yeah, but their council was It was promoted by a London firm. That's Liverpool Council for there it. Is it. Right. There's one thing that we can't Liverpool really do. Can we? Can I ask a question it of the audience? It was promoted by a London firm. I mean, not, in this last minute, a quick comment. Was not the Lennon memory solid by Yoko Ono? Is not the Yoko Ono part of this book, for those who have read it, one of the most difficult parts? Do we all, do all we who love Lennon love Yoko, sir? No. I think no. there's a little, little point that hasn't been made. Is it not possible to be a murderous homosexual and a genius? Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, what's someone being homosexual? <laughs> 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 what are they we joking about <laughs> Albert Goldman again? Right. Uh, can I say so? That is the most valuable comment I've heard all evening. <laughs> and I, I can't work out why we all bother about the artist's personality. Mr. Goldman, would you agree with that comment? I think, did you hear that one? Yes, it's perfectly uh, possible. Fine. And Alan, we can make the point, I mean, can I have a last couple of comments from the audience as we go in the last few seconds? You, sir, yes, quickly. I'd like to raise the point again about, about this thing that the Beatles not doing anything for Liverpool and no new talent coming out to Liverpool. There's plenty of new talent coming out to Liverpool. Liverpool is one of the fastest growing tourism cities in the country. And one of the reasons why it is is quite simply because the Beatles came from that city. And year after year, millions and millions of people come and to see come where the Beatles right. came Another from. Another quick out of Manchester. Quick comment from you in the middle there, sir. Yes, go on, sir. You've got a point to make or you're just scratching your neck. Dr. Goldman. Good evening to you. Now, in your latest book Good on evening. Elvis, uh, Elvis, The Last 24 Hours, you portray the king of rock and roll as a simple-minded junkie with a death wish, a very, very sad and a very pathetic figure. Would that be a fair assessment of where your researchers have led you? Yes. At the end, uh, there really wasn't much left of Elvis. He was an invalid. Uh, his uh, voice had pretty well gone. He dreaded the thought of confronting the public again particularly because there had been a book published that exposed all his uh, antisocial habits, his uh, use of guns and other dangerous weapons, his rages, his senseless behavior, and particularly his drug addiction. Uh, he fancied himself a messiah, which is an incredibly blasphemous oh, no notion. Way. No way. Elvis cut his religion to his own cloth. Edward Starr. I can't, I can't believe that he can sit there and say things like that. I mean, it's a contradiction in fact in what he's saying. First of all, A number one, it is physically impossible for someone to induce in many drugs, as he says, and perform anywhere in the world in any kind of position whatsoever. Well, I don't think uh, at the end of his life Elvis felt he had any choice but to commit suicide. Uh, he, he, had, he had so many things. <laughs> he had so many adverse conditions. Oh, and you have uh, written books, of course, we've got a book out at the moment about Elton John. You've written a very good book, Shout About the Beatles. You've uh, done a book on the Rolling Stones. What do you think about the work of your fellow biographer, your partner in... Albert Goldman is probably the only biographer in history whose books one can read and think that nothing in them is right. It's a, a miracle that he manages to spell the name John Lennon right. <laughs> idiotic, malevolent mistakes that crowd these pages. The general effect is not as learning about a person, but being run over by a convoy of manure trucks.
to read an Albert Goldman book. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's yeah. The true half-wit is writing a book here, a book that contradicts itself page by page. But, but you, in his, pic, in his uh, book about Lenin, on one page Lenin is afraid of Yoko, on the next page is trying to murder her, on one page he's a recluse, the next page he's going round the world, on one page he never sees anybody, the next page he's seeing his 30, 30 staff retinue. Albert Goldman thinks that Love Me Do, the Beatles' first record, was a 78 RPM record. <laughs> Albert Goldman I don't think thinks that. I made a little mistake. You know, I don't really, I'm Goldman really not on this program to listen to Albert fellow Goldman authors announce me, so it doesn't interest me at all to listen to this. And I intend to speak right through the balance of this denunciation. Okay, okay. We will now have a little shot of please, one at a time. We must have some order here. Dr. Goldman has every right. Dr. Goldman. It's a doctorate in writing broken I have no intention of listening to a rival author denounce me, and I will just continue to talk right through this denunciation. All right, Dr. Goldman, I want to ask you a question. Is it not the case that a lot of your book is <laughs> supposition and it's not based on facts? No, it's all based on very well-researched facts. And if any of my books, may I add this, if any of my books were really based on supposition, if they were false, if they libeled someone, these people, 90% of them are alive, like Yoko Ono. They are in a position to sue me, collect huge damages from me and from my publisher. As a matter of fact, no one has ever brought suit in all these years. How can... So, one second. What, why one why second. haven't they? One second. Right, Dr. Goldman, how can you really get to the heart of a subject if, in Elvis Presley's case, for example, you didn't speak to his wife, Priscilla Presley, his ex-wife, you didn't speak to Yoko Ono, you didn't speak to Cynthia Lennon, so you don't really have the full picture, do you? That is around the nonsensical proposition. Uh, what I find totally spurious is this ridiculous idea that you've tacked on that he committed suicide merely to resell chapter one of your tedious no, dull not, book oh, from ten God. years ago. What we've got now is a, a very small, cheap and nasty book with very big words in it for no, people that don't read very often. And, you're, and, and your only reason for recycling this garbage is that you've suddenly decided ten years later that he probably committed suicide. You're a charlatan, sir. Admit yes. it. The only person you're serving is your bank manager. <laughs> right, Dr. Goldman. Uh, you know, I really didn't come on this show to be denounced by people who either are rival authors or people who don't have any identity at all. They get up out of nowhere and start denouncing me. If someone wants to ask me an intelligent question, I'm happy to answer. If they simply want to abuse me, I will do what I did to the last gentleman who abused me. I will simply continue to talk right through your denunciation. No, is it not the case? Please, is it not the case? We I must have some control here. Listen, Tony Prince is one of the few British disc jockeys. Tony Prince is one of the few British disc jockeys who ever met Elvis Presley. I think uh, the royal ruler from the golden days of Radio Luxembourg, Tony, we've actually got a photograph of you with Elvis Presley here. Now, does the Elvis Presley that Dr... Oh, silence, I don't believe it. <laughs> does the Elvis Presley that Dr. Goldman writes about in any way, in any way square with the Elvis Presley that you know and love? I, I, I can't relate to the man I met. I met Elvis on two occasions in 72 and 73, and I've been very close to him for many years as president of his fan club. I'm a big fan of the fans, and I'm more worried about the harm that, although Nina wouldn't support it, I'm more worried about the harm that Albert, if I may call him Albert, everybody's calling him Doctor for some reason tonight, I regard him as an Albert. He's a doctor an ordinary, English. An ordinary journalist who's found a niche market slime. We, we actually, out of respect for Elvis, excuse me, I read reports in the papers, we read the bits and bats we had to read, but I didn't, out of principle, read the book. In fact, we raised money for charity, Albert. You'll be pleased to hear your book actually raised money for charity because at the first convention after your book, we burned every page on stage until the great delight. Bravo. But I, I believe that Albert is the clever guy because he is a very professional journalist professional who has journalist. learned who has learned how to manipulate the words of other people. And he has learned he has learned the lengths he can go to without being sued. He knows that art. Yeah. He's the king of that art, yeah. and he is yeah. the king That's of slime, funny. and I hope he drowns That's in the slime. Right. The face in the mirror won't stop. The boozing and all-night cruising made a shambles of his life. Controversial author Albert Goldman investigated Morrison's mysterious death and blamed it on a lethal mixture of booze and heroin. He was often involved in violence and accidents, cracking up his car, stuff like that. 
He was the most extremely self-destructive person. In fact, my sense of him is that he aimed to live a short but extremely interesting life. Self.